Thank you all for coming. Um, we're all from OHRP, and we're going to discuss guidance relating to standards of care. And let me, at the beginning, I'll tell you a little bit about the big picture. I'm going to discuss um, what is really at stake here. And after I speak, uh, Ivor Pritchard uh, will speak a bit exactly about the details of our draft guidance. And then we'll have discussion. And that will include uh, myself, Ivor, and Julie Conoshero. So again, welcome. Uh, this is a very important issue. Um, there is an ongoing debate about this, and we are encouraging even further debate because we want to make sure we get this right. Um, just to frame the issue, we're talking about studies that involve comparisons of standards of care. Basically, two treatments that if you have a particular medical problem and you go to a doctor, a doctor could give you one of these types of treatments. And the issue is, what if you do a research study in which you're randomizing people between two of these versions of standard of care? What does that involve in terms of, particularly in terms of consent? And there's been a movement out there among quite a few people saying, gee, in those studies, they're almost all minimal risk, perhaps, or lots of them are minimal risk. And as a result of that, the more extreme view is you don't even have to get informed consent. You could just randomize people without telling them. A somewhat less extreme view is let's figure out ways to somehow make the informed consent a little more minimal than we usually require, or perhaps have even an opt-out so that people actually are in the study unless they respond to some email or send back some letters saying they don't want to be in the study. So I think that's the heart of it. Um, I am going to end up saying a bit about a study called support, which involved giving oxygen, different you know, levels of oxygen to premature infants. And this is not about support. We're going forward. We're going to talk about draft guidance. We're going to talk about what the rules should be. But the important thing is that support demonstrates a fact pattern. And the key thing is understanding the fact pattern about that is centered around this debate. And there's another type of study people are now talking about that's actually very different from support and raises very different issues. So I'm going to try to highlight that difference, particularly at the end of the talk. So let me start going here. And, and just it, it, I, I want to sort of add one extra point here. Um, a lot of the, the talk about this, in, in a sense, the pushback against what OHRP is doing is from people who are saying, well, we're not going to be able to do these studies. And I just want to highlight OHRP is very much in favor of making sure our rules work for our modern research establishment. Um, we've been doing that in many, many ways. We're interested in doing that in terms of consent, too. The question is, there are right and wrong ways of doing things. And so that really is the heart of this issue. Uh, again, any opinions any of us express are our own opinions and not necessarily those of Health and Human Services. Um, so you may remember the AT&T commercial where the guy is sitting at the little table with all the little kids and they're all saying these fascinating things is bigger, better than smaller and that sort of thing. And I think at the heart of this, a lot of people have tried to complicate this issue, and it actually isn't that complicated. If you've worked in the human protections area, if you're familiar with our underlying ethical rules in terms of why we get consent and why research is sort of different from clinical care, those rules will actually give you pretty clear answers in terms of these scenarios. Um, again, as I indicated, there are different types of studies, and at the end we'll talk about the different types of studies, but I'm going to try to demonstrate to you there's actually a pretty straightforward analysis here of at least the fact patterns that were similar to support. And, and this slide sort of lays out the core of it, and hopefully none of this is going to be you know, unusual to you in terms of how we regulate research. Um, so let's assume we have a study and it involves changing what happens to the person. So there are key things here. We're talking about changing something, okay? If you're not changing what happens to somebody, we're not, that's not the fact pattern we're talking about. It involves a change. And more than the change, that as a result of that change, that change is going to cause the person to be exposed to suspected risk, suspected identified risk. So another thing, no gotcha here. There are claims about support that we were after the fact when the study discovered some new risk, saying, well, that should have been disclosed. Nobody's saying that you have to disclose a risk that you don't know about. We're talking about a risk that, at the start of the study, you've already identified it. And in particular, I'll clarify this, it's asymmetric in terms of your suspicion. You sus suspect that 
arm A will have more of this risk than arm B, which again is information somebody actually might want to use in terms of deciding do I or do I not want to be randomized as opposed to getting arm A or, or, or getting arm B. So if this happens, you're changing what happens to somebody, you're going to expose them to some suspected risks, normally we say you should let the person know about it. Again, it's not very complicated. Um, and I'm going to spell out more about this. Um, okay, notice nothing in this concept. Let me just let me skip some right. Okay, nothing in this concept um, has anything to do with whether or not the risks are part of standard care or not. This is a broad, generalizable concept. Bottom line is, we generally don't expose people to risks for purposes of research without letting them know about that. And I'm going to even narrow it further. Let's assume that the difference in risk we're talking about is more than minimal risk, which is an important concept. But that's what we're going to be concentrating on. We're not concentrating on the small stuff, minimal risk stuff. Let's mainly talk about important differences in risks. We generally let people say yes or no to that. Um, Another point, a little more subtle, is that it doesn't matter whether the risks are experimental or not, well understood or not, or even if, if it's a type of risk that people are exposed to every day. If you're familiar with how our rules work, we generally say you want to expose somebody to a risk in research, you tell them about that risk. So to, to just give you a, an example, um, imagine somebody's out there and um, they're contemplating you know, getting in shape and they want to do some weightlifting. They've never done that before. It happens to be a researcher out there who wants to study people who've never lifted weights and they want to study how they move, that sort of thing. And let's assume there are certain risks in terms of weightlifting, depending on the, the, the weight of the weights they're going to be lifting and that sort of thing. If you're conducting this study, then presumably you will tell them, well, we're going to ask you to weight lift, uh, lift weights a certain way, and we're going to explain to you there are some risks known about that, and we want to tell you that so that you're willing to be in the study. Could be millions of people out there every day are busy lifting weights. This particular person, they're not in great shape. They're already thinking of lifting weights, but they're doing it as part of this study. The researcher asked them to do this. Nothing innovative about it. It's not an experimental risk, but we disclose it. The bottom line is, again, the theme. You're asking people to do something for purposes of research. You let them know what the risks are. Again, our thinking is pretty straightforward. Now, the flip side, we want to be very fair about this. If you're not changing what happens to somebody, uh, the risks that they're getting exactly the treatment they would have gotten had they not been in the study. So you're enrolling people in the study who are already going to get treatment X, and, and you're then going to do some other thing to them, but they're going to get treatment X in the study. Nobody's saying the risks of treatment X suddenly became research risks. No, you haven't changed anything. The key point here is if you change what happens to somebody, that's what's triggering the further thinking. Are you changing it, and are you then exposing them to newer, different risks than they otherwise would have been exposed to? Um, and I've sort of already told you this point. Uh, we're assuming in the studies that we're going to talk about that there is concern at the outset of the study that th there is a risk difference between what would have they would have gotten outside of the study and what they get inside of the study, and that that risk difference is more than minimal. Again, we want to concentrate on the more significant studies in terms of risks. And again, the point is we have already identified specific suspected asymmetric differences. What I was telling you is we, we suspect, not sure, we have not proven it, that drug A has more of a particular risk than drug B. Um, at the end, I'm going to talk about a different type of study, as I told you. And let me give you, you know, um, I'm going to call these we're clueless studies because it's basically we have two drugs out there or two treatments for a particular medical problem, and we want to compare them, but we have we're clueless in terms of possible differences between them. We have no reason to think one is more efficacious than the other. We have no reason to think one has any risk that's different than the others. There may be differences, but we don't know what they are. Think about that, and again, I'll tell you more at the end, that is a very different type of study than the study that this debate has been about up till now, support type like studies. Um, so what is at stake here? As I told you at the beginning, a lot of people want to sort of say we don't need consent in these studies, and one of the main themes in terms of their saying we don't need consent is what does it mean they're going to say, tell the person perhaps if they get consent at all, well, in any event, it's a minimal risk study. You don't really have to worry about it. And I would just want to explore a bit. What does it mean when you have a consent form? And in the risk section, it tells you this is minimal risk. And it probably means what a lot of you have thought about, okay? Here's the message it sends. 
it doesn't matter much whether or not I enter this study. Uh, nothing important to me will turn on whether or not I participate in this study. There's no me need for me to think hard about whether or not to be in this study. And hopefully you all agree with that, right? You're telling somebody in the risk section, this is minimal risk. It's like, don't worry about it. It really isn't an important decision about whether you're in this study or not. And in particular, if you're in this study, nothing particularly bad is going to happen to you. You know, you're may be pricked by a blood draw, something like that. You may be made uncomfortable. Maybe your arm hurts for a few minutes, whatever it is. Nothing kind of incredibly serious. Um, and what I want to sort of get you to understand is that in the studies that we're talking about, this is not true. These are not minimal risk studies, which is not to say there may be some minimal risk studies, but again, we're going to talk about the core studies that our draft guidance is talking about. And the bottom line is we shouldn't be providing information in a consent form telling somebody a study is minimal risk if, in fact, it isn't minimal risk. Uh, this may, of course, cause them to be in the study when they really wouldn't have had they been given truthful information. Um, so let me, since, since we're talking about, again, studies that randomize somebody between two versions of standard of care, let me tell you a little bit about standard of care. Because standard of care is actually a very broad and kind of vague concept. It's basically how the legal system says, okay, you, doctor, can provide this treatment to people for this particular medical condition. And the system intentionally gives doctors a lot of flexibility to do that because they're professionals. We want to allow doctors to exercise you know, their thinking. Oh, so I didn't tell you in the terms of this one. Okay, so these are some myths that people, particularly people sort of arguing about kind of the support issues. Two different standard of care treatments for a medical problem have risks that are always of the same type. That's just wrong. You could come up with, again, on any of the myths I'm telling you here, you could come up with thousands and thousands of examples. This is just not right. Uh, two different standard of care treatments for a medical problem necessarily have risks that are always of the same magnitude. No. I mean, one could sort of have a significantly increased likelihood of killing you, and the other, you know, less likelihood, but the first one could have a greater chance of actually curing your disease. It's up to somebody, well, how much am I willing to risk my life to cure my very serious disease? Um, that's something, you know, people think about. Um, and finally, that there's some sort of cap on how different the risks of two standard of care treatments for a medical problem can be. Uh, there isn't any cap. I mean, basically, you got standard of care treatment A and standard of care, care treatment B. They could be very, very different. The difference in their risk levels could be very, very different. None of this is saying it's anything wrong about the types of standard of care we're talking about. This is just the truth about the way our system works. It's not like saying we have two studies out there and they both involve minimal risk. That is a totally different universe in terms of what we're talking about here, that you're randomizing people between two standard of care treatments. Okay, and this is what I already told you, right? There are often substantially different risks from different versions of standard of care. And most importantly, choosing what version of standard of care you're going to be treated with often is one of the most important decisions you're ever going to make if you have a really serious medical problem and there, in fact, is one, more than one version of standard of care. This is a very, very you know, meaningful decision that probably you're going to be told in the clinical context, you should think long and hard about this, talk to a lot of doctors if it's a really serious problem, and figure out what, which of these versions is really what you want, which might get you thinking, well, maybe, therefore, being randomized among them might require some thinking, too. And let me give you an example. Um, applying sort of the notion of myth. So what I'm giving you here in this slide and next one is from a real consent form. Um, this is a federally funded study. I believe it's still taking place. Um, and this is a study about a medical condition, a serious disease that if it was left untreated, at least according to NIH's website about this, you would die in two years. Um, so it's a very serious condition, and what they're doing in the study is trying to see, it's often able to put people in remission. So what they're trying to figure out is how long can we keep them in remission. So they're talking about giving some drug for a longer period of time to see if it keeps them in remission. The drug has some side effects, it's not totally benign, versus randomizing some people to not get that drug. You'd think that, you know, is a pretty significant thing that somebody should think hard about, long and hard about. And this is the consent form, and this is what it says in the risk section, or, or most of it. Because both of these treatment approaches are considered to be standard of care, participation in this study is considered to cause you minimal risk. 
And then it goes on, the only risk to those who take part in this study is the potential loss of privacy if you choose to share your condition through online social media. Again, a real interventional clinical trial about a serious disease, and I think this is very typical of, of the argument of a lot of people out there. It's sort of applying it. It's minimal risk. Both treatments are standard of care. What is there to kind of worry about? Um, and hopefully, as you think about this, you could recognize, yeah, maybe you want to think twice about are you more concerned about making sure your disease stays in remission versus the risks of this drug that, that you're going to take for quite a while. Um, so now let me move on to this other aspect of, of what people are debating here and the issue of how proven does a risk have to be? How sure do we have to be about our risk before we let people know about it? And the bottom line, you know, getting to the conclusion ahead of time is that in the research area, we often deal with risks that are uncertain, and we generally err on the side of letting people know about them. That's what research is all about. You want to make sure the person, the, the, the subject, is appropriately informed. Um, if you watch Game of Thrones, you've probably heard this statement multiple times uh, from Egret, you know nothing, Jon Snow. And I think this is very, very relevant here because you're going to see the debate when I finally line it up between the support type studies and this other type of studies is a question of do we know anything right now or suspect, even suspect anything about possible differences between the two treatments that we're letting people get. And there is a, 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 a sort of one viewpoint in terms of this is that we actually know nothing. We're totally clueless. Remember the we're clueless studies in terms of any differences and therefore there are no differences to warn the subject about. And the bottom line in terms of the facts, thinking about what is actually out there. Well, actually, in a lot of studies, including support in the studies like that, we actually do know something. We suspect something. And normally, when we suspect something, we let the subjects know about it because it's their health that they're putting on at risk here. And they have a right to make a decision about it. So let's say more about, OK. So yeah, this you know nothing thing I sort of call radical knowledge denial, that in almost all these studies, we know nothing about possible differences in unproven risks. And we'll go over some of them and demonstrate, gee, that's not true. There are some studies where we know nothing, the we're clueless studies, and we'll talk about those at the end. Um, so what are the people saying who kind of say, you know, we know nothing? And total risk is absolutely 100% understood and proven. It is unnecessary for researchers to disclose it to potential subjects. Um, another way of, of stating that, where the risks are uncertain, though suspected, it really makes no difference whether a patient is randomized in a study or a doctor chooses which version of standard care to provide. Both are equally ar arbitrary. So notice what they're saying there. They're saying if you went to the doctor, if you went to different doctors, one of them might have prescribed treatment A, one of, them, one of them might have prescribed treatment B. Because of that, we could just randomize you between the two of them. And that's the heart of it. Um, and it's a pretty potent statement. If you act, you know, depending on it, whether you accept it. Now, so what's the truth? Okay, because this is all sort of um, untrue. People make decisions using tentative information all the time. This is a part of everyday life. Has always been a core concept of informed consent and in research, where there is, by definition, uncertainty. Right. That's why we do research. We we suspect some things, but we have not yet proven them, and we want to find information about it. And again, if you've been dealing with consent and our underlying ethical thinking, of course, we tell people about these suspected risks. We do that all the time. This is nothing new. So let me give you some real examples. And just this is an example involving me. Um, you know, kind of I'm more involved with it. So um, I thought about it a lot. So I, uh, earlier this year, I had to go undergo open heart surgery to repair my mitral valve. Uh, you know, before that, I thought my heart was uh, pretty fine, and suddenly you learn you're kind of in, in heart failure, and this is a very bad thing, and somebody tells you, well, you need this surgery. And the surgery I ended up getting, they cut the middle of my sternum, my breastbone, and pry it apart, and they go into the heart and repair the heart valve. And they did a really, really good job. Um, they were great, great team. So, um, and it was actually in Maryland. So. Um, so let's assume I was about to get the surgery, a week before the surgery. And I actually talked with a bunch of doctors, and they all agreed, this is the right thing to do. You cut the sternum, you go in that way, yada, yada. 
Um, so let's assume a week before, and this is all hypothetical, a week before I got the surgery, uh, my doctor comes to me and says, you know, I learned they're doing this randomized study about the best ways to do the surgery. And there's another way to do it. Instead of splitting your breastbone, there's a way to go on the right side between two of your ribs and make a fairly small cut. And, you know, a lot of doctors are doing this. And the study basically will randomize you between these two ways of treating it. And, and what I just told you about the other treatment is totally correct. It is, in fact, another version of standard of care. You could go to the website of the Cleveland Clinic, which lists about five different ways they could do this. The Cleveland Clinic is like the best place in the world for doing this. They do thousands of these procedures. Um, so they're randomizing me between two different treatments. And it's complicated, but if you read out there, there are some concerns about the differences between these two treatments, including the between the ribs approach might increase the risk of getting a stroke. Now, on the other side, there are some risks of, of going through the breastbone. Uh, it could be that you'll be in the hospital a few more days. You're going to certainly have more, perhaps, uh, decreased endurance. You've got to worry a lot about the breastbone breaking apart again and not healing and that sort of stuff. So bottom line, there are different risks. They're both standard of care treatments, but again, the theme you were hearing from others is that they're both standard of care treatments. You shouldn't care about one versus the other, and therefore it would be perfectly acceptable for us to randomize you. And let's assume even they were the same and it wasn't so different between breaking, cutting the breastbone or going between the ribs. Again, as long as there are risk differences, presumably significant risk differences, more than minimal risk differences, presumably the usual rules are that prospective subjects should know about that. Um, so let me talk a bit about support. Um, and okay, let me give you an overview of support. Support was about how much oxygen do you give a premature infant? And the starting point that everybody accepted, and I'm not going to dispute, is that at the time, standard care, meaning what some doctors were doing without committing malpractice, was to give an oxygen percentage between 85% and 95%. And the big dispute was, well, where in that range should you treat an infant? And the concern, the reason they were doing the study was that if you give too much oxygen, you're going to cause infants to develop a condition called retinopathy of prematurity, which can lead to blindness in some cases. And everybody agrees that's a very, very bad thing. You certainly don't want that to happen to your infant. So the concern was that within that range of 85 to 95, perhaps at the 95 level or close to 95, you're getting too much of this blindness developing. And if we could go to lower levels, maybe we'll have less blindness. Now, there's another aspect of what happened in the study, and let me just tell you this, but some people dispute it. They're wrong, but they dispute it. Um, at the lower end, there was concern about other bad things happening, close to 85, because your infant is not getting enough oxygen. And in particular, if you're not getting enough oxygen, they may be having an increased risk of dying or they may have an increased risk of permanent brain damage. So this is a complicated thing, and nobody was saying it's easy for parents to decide where in this range you want to be. Very different risks at, at, at either end. But of course, the question might be, is it for a researcher to make that decision when they're asking you to be in a study and to tell you, by the way, this is a minimal risk study, or should they sort of be explaining this is a difficult decision? It's not like there's a clear, obvious answer, but it's your infant. You know, it, it's your child. You should get to make the decision. Um, so I want to say more about this study in a moment, but as I told you, there is a dispute at the low end about the existence of those risks in terms of increased mortality and increased brain damage. And I have a number of slides here, and you don't even have to read them, but this is just demonstrating that, in fact, the people who designed the study and were conducting it multiple times in major journals said these are risks at the low end that we're concerned about, that this is the purpose of the study. And I'm just putting this in the record. I'll quickly go through these, but people could certainly, if people watch the video later on, could go through all of them. But again, multiple statements from, oh, and the other thing is this study actually took place in five countries, including the you know, US and four others. Probably tens of millions of dollars were spent on it. So again, these are just a number of statements, including this particular statement is, is uh, something called a Cochrane Collaboration um, Report. And basically, it's supposed to be an unbiased report of what we understand about a particular problem. 
And this is co-authored. In fact, the lead author was the woman who was in charge of coordinating the five studies across all the five countries, noting basically that, of course, we're worried about the death and disability. And she's noting we're worried about that, even though there are some stu recent studies that didn't show that. But everybody indicated those studies you know, were not particularly compelling. So there was still an open question. Um, this is from the consent forms. Um, oh, and this was from the actual final published report in the New England Journal. So the authors of, of the results themselves said they were concerned about the adverse outcomes, including mortality and neurodevelopmental outcomes. So, okay, so that's what they were worried about. Um, okay, so now let me just, I've told you a little bit about support. Let's assume there were no risks at the low end of support. So I want to accept what the critics were saying, that they had no idea about increased mortality at the low end or increased brain damage. All they were worried about was the increased, possibly increased risk of uh, retinopathy prematurity, of possible blindness at the high end. In many of the centers, and this is directly from the Duke consent form, the goal before the study took place was to keep the infants between 88 and 92, and that's what we're showing here. And, and I have to say, the curves are not designed to be perfect. You know, they're sort of quasi-normal. We're not great artists on our end, okay? And here's the goal in the support study. Um, half the infants would be randomized to the low side. You can see the curve there between 85 and 89, and half on the high side between 91 and 90. So, and this is just putting the curves together. So if you were at an institution that was starting out trying to keep the infants between um, 88 and 92, and then your infant is in the study, they're moved from that middle zone, the yellow zone, to either the blue or the red zone. And so the question I have for you, remember these people were saying, it's all standard of care, what's to worry about? There are zero risks here or minimal risk or whatever it is. Half the time, this infant would be randomized to that red zone, the higher zone. And remember, the only risk they were worried about was that the infant might develop retinopathy of prematurity. Um, and let me add one other thing. Over time, gradually, the oxygen level that most doctors were using was dropping. It was getting lower and lower, okay? It was getting closer to 85. So you're asking parents to agree to their child to be in this study. Um, they're starting on the yellow range, and they have a 50% chance of being moved to the red range, orange range. Why is that good for them? Okay, we're sitting there thinking that the higher range maybe is increasing the risk of retinopathy of prematurity. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I still haven't gotten a clear answer to that. There's a 50% chance this will happen to your infant. Um, why, would, why would parents, if they were given appropriate information, think that's a good thing. Now again, if you thought there were risks at the low end, that gets a little more complicated. But again, a lot of the critics are saying there were no risks at the low end. So it's sort of like, okay. You know, and, and interestingly, everybody who did this study, they all have the clinical information. What would be great for them to come forward and show us the actual distribution of what oxygen levels the infants were getting before the study and what they got after the study. And over time, what was happening to the oxygen levels? I suspect in, in centers that were keeping people in the yellow range, for clinical purposes, none of them were sort of, you know, frequently or even infrequently going to the parents and saying, oh, why don't we increase the oxygen on your infant? Unless there was something specifically bad about that infant's medical condition. Again, they were moving toward the low end. So it's like, why is it good for your infant to move them to the high end? So, so I told you about, remember, the we're clueless studies. That's what I want to talk about now. And I want to highlight this is a very different type of study that the debate compared to what the debate has been about up to now. And um, this is a study where there's no good reason to even suspect specific risk differences between the two treatments. So to give you an example, in the New England Journal, if you've read in the last couple of weeks, had two articles which are pretty, raising, pretty much raising exactly this issue. You have a number of drugs for asthma. You're going to be in a study and you're going to compare two of them. As far as we know, and so let's take this as a given because you have to assume this, these drugs have the same risks, the same percentages and likelihood of any of those risks, and the same likelihood of curing or, you know, making your condition better. Um, again, we're clueless in terms of differences between them. The reason we're doing the study is we don't suspect a particular difference, but we want to compare them and see which is better. 
which is not to say there is not a legitimate reason to do that, but very different than the scenario we were talking about before, which was that we suspect a particular asymmetry in terms of one of the drugs being better than the other. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about now. And so let me talk about that kind of a study for a moment, okay? First of all, are there a lot of such studies taking place right now? Okay, where are the studies where, again, remember all the conditions that have to be in place. We have no reason to suspect any particular differences between the two drugs in terms of efficacy, in terms of risks. And I have to say, I haven't heard a lot about real studies such as that. It certainly wasn't the support study. And let me mention another study, if you've gone to other sessions here or if you've read in the literature, PCORI. Um, a very famous group out there that the federal government is funding is giving them billions of dollars to do comparative effectiveness research, very similar to the sorts of research we're talking about here. Um, and it's, mo or I think some will say, most famous study, because the, the first study that's going to use its, its giant database, what's called PCORnet, is involving aspirin. And what they want to see is, is baby dose, is a baby aspirin dose versus an adult aspirin dose, which of those is better in terms of both side effects and in terms of reducing the likelihood of your having worsening of your cardiovascular disease, getting strokes or heart attacks, that sort of thing. A very important study. I, I mean, they're, I think they're, they're in a pilot phase in terms of proposing it. Uh, that's going to take $10 million, and then there can be a much longer phase. Notice, would we say there are no differences between a baby dose and an adult dose of aspirin? I suspect most IRBs wouldn't have a problem saying, no, there are differences there. In fact, the very fact that we're doing this study, okay, if, because the concern is, the current recommendation is to you, the government recommendation is to use the low dose, but apparently more than half patients end up getting the bigger dose. Well, you know, why do we care about that? Presumably the bigger dose might actually be more effective. It might not be. It might be that there's no difference in efficacy in terms of, you know, dealing with your increasing cardiovascular risks. On the other hand, if we didn't think there was a significant risk difference in terms of the you know, stomach problems and everything, then why don't we put everybody on the larger dose? But clearly we don't. And the reason PCORI is willing to spend millions and millions of dollars on this is because we, in fact, appreciate that there are significant risk differences between, or we suspect at least, the low dose and the high dose. Again, not all I'm saying is this is not a we're clueless study. So, and again, so I'm just saying I haven't seen these studies, and I, I don't think there are real studies out there, or not many of them. Uh, how much interest is, is, is there in doing such studies, given that there are limited resources? If we have drugs out there that are being used to treat the same condition, and we know there are differences between them, maybe those are the ones we should study first, because we already suspect there's a difference. Let's prove it and be sure about it before we pick on all the drugs where we have no idea about any possible differences. And finally, let's assume there is such a study one of these were clueless studies. Let's accept what the New England Journal says. What would have to be disclosed as risks in such a study? This is from the New England Journal's, one of their articles from a week or two ago, and they're saying this is according to the OHRP guidance what would have to be disclosed. Nah. Um, this is nowhere near what we're talking about. If you go back to what I said earlier, we're talking about different risks, identified dif different risks between the two arms. We're here we're talking about a study where there are no identified different risks. We're just sort of saying maybe there's one somewhere on one of these risks. Uh, in fact, all they did was cut out the uh, physician's desk reference discussion of this. We've never in any study of any type said you have to lay out everything in the physician's desk reference desk reference, which is showing you the sort of the, the, the games playing that is happening out there in terms of telling every, everybody doing research, you've got to worry about OHRP asking for this. Um, and this is just quoting part of the draft guidance indicating what I was talking about. And the bottom line is, in that type of study, you could probably disclose the risks in a few sentences, and we probably wouldn't be requiring you to disclose any of those specific risks. It will be discussing something relating to, look, we're comparing these two drugs, and at the moment we don't have any reason to suspect differences and you know, say a little more about that. Um, okay, so the bottom line is basically, look, you're going to randomize people to two different versions of standard of care. If you're going to change what happens to them and you're going to change the risks that they might be exposed to, particularly where that difference is more than minimal risk, we should let them know. This is nothing new. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and we'll go on to Ivor.
So we'll, we'll have discussions after Ivor speak, because Ivor's going to explain some more details of, of the draft guidance, which pretty much does what I was saying. So I'm going to try and keep this short, um, despite the fact that it's against my philosophical training. Uh, but what I'm going to do is to concentrate on the specifics of what the draft guidance says. Uh, Jerry has identified a general perspective um, for which he's suggesting that the analysis applies um, actually more broadly than our draft guidance um, focuses on. But what I'm going to do is to try to draw your attention specifically to the points that are made in the draft guidance document so that we can talk about them. So here are the four questions that the draft guidance is framed around, and I'm going to talk about each one of those in turn. I'll give you a sec to look in case you haven't looked at it before. By the way, while those of you are reading, multitask, show of hands, how many of you have read the draft guidance at this point? And how many of you have not had a chance to look at it yet? OK, that's helpful. That'll let me go a little faster. OK. so. This is the first question of the draft guidance, and the point is to identify sort of what the scope of the jurisdiction of this guidance is about, um, because it is about the notion of research involving standards of care, but there are a number of different ways of interpreting the notion of standards of care. And in this draft guidance, we're using a relatively narrow notion of standards of care. Sometimes the term standards of care is used to refer to any kind of circumstance in which doctors routinely do something to address a particular medical condition. We're, sa we're saying that while our analysis might apply that widely, we're in fact confining the scope of the guidance to the circumstance in which there is some kind of um, recognition by the medical community um, that a particular standard of care is, should be considered a standard of care. Now the basis for that recognition by medical experts does still vary. It may be that there are two or three or four or five randomized trials of various sizes that underlie the position that is taken about the couple of options being standards of care. Or it, it may be research that falls short of that. There may be observational studies. Or it may be that there has been some kind of consensus panel of a group of medical experts who agree that something ought to be considered standard of care, but it's only those kinds of studies that involve medically recognized standards of care that this draft guidance um, pertains to. The second question has to do with identifying what counts as a risk of research. This is the actual regulatory provision on which our anal analysis is based. And as you've already heard Jerry say, we're looking at the circumstance in which we're looking at risks which are a function of participation in research rather than those that are a function of just having that medical condition or being treated for that condition. So the basic position we're taking is that if there's something different that is going to happen to the subjects as a function of their participating in research, 
if they may be assigned to a standard of care that they wouldn't have gotten had they gone to their clinician and just asked for treatment, um, then if it is also true that there are identified risks that may be different for that standard of care that they're going to be given as a function of participating in the research study, then th those risks should be considered standard of care. It may well be that some of the people who participate in the study will get the same standard of care that they would have gotten had they not participated in the study. But since they do participate in the research study, we don't actually know which, one, which ones of the people who participate in the study will get exactly what they would have gotten and which ones are gonna get something different from what they would have gotten. But we do know that a significant portion of them, and we don't know which individuals it are, that we don't know which individuals they are, are going to get something different and therefore be exposed to a different risk than they would have been had they just gone to their clinician and gotten some kind of treatment. And so that represents something that they otherwise, a risk that they otherwise would not have been exposed to. Then the next question has to do with trying to figure out what counts as a purpose of the research. And so we're saying that if a research study is focusing on trying to identify how much or how frequently a harm will be experienced by a subject as a function of participating in the study. And it's true that this is a sufficiently important question to look at that it makes sense to actually carry out the study because we need to be able to justify the importance of getting the information that the study provides against the risks to which some of the people who participate in the study will be exposed, then that counts as being a purpose of the study that you're doing the study in order to find out how often and what kind, what whether that harm actually occurs depending on which standard of care treatment you get. Yep, need to go back one. And then the fourth question more or less puts the prior two questions together with respect to another regulatory provision, which says that subjects deserve to be told in the informed consent process what the reasonably foreseeable risks of the study are, all right? And in the answer to the second question, we identified what the risks of research are. And in the third, we identified what counts as a purpose. And if it's true that a research study is trying to find out whether a harm occurs in one standard of treatment occurs more or less or the same as in the other treatment, if the design of the study is embracing the idea, well, we might find out that there's no difference in the amount of harm people will be exposed to. We might find out that treatment A creates better harm, greater harm. We might find out that treatment B creates better harm. We're doing the study to find out which one of those three things might happen. We are saying that this recognizes that these risks, this kind of risk is indeed reasonably foreseeable 
because it's embedded in the very purpose of the research study. And the conclusion of the, re of the guidance basically puts those things together and says that if evaluating a particular risk of research associated with a standard of care is a purpose of the research, then the research risk being evaluated has been recognized as a sufficiently possible outcome to make it a reasonably foreseeable risk that should be disclosed. Um, we said, we put this out in a Federal Register notice um, providing 60 days for people to comment. Um, what is it? We have now about 15, 16 more days uh, before that deadline comes along. You can submit comments and you can also look at the comments if you want to see what people are already saying. I downloaded the comments a couple of days ago. I think there were about 12 of them. And surprise, surprise, already among those 12, there were some people saying, you got it dead right. There are some people saying, you got it dead wrong. There are some people saying, you should have said it more clearly than you did. It's confusing. And there are some people saying, you should have talked about this or this in addition to what you did talk about. Um, and I just want to remind people, call to people's attention, the idea that if you have any of those reactions, we do want to hear those reactions in all four of those categories of types of answers. I had a conversation yesterday with someone who said, well, in my bailiwick, we only comment when we think you got it wrong because we think that the only influence we can have is to point out a mistake and keep you from making it, right? But it is also, in fact, important for us to understand what the distribution of beliefs is about whether we've said it clearly or whether we've said it in a confusing way, whether you think we do have it right or whether you think that there's something that we really ought to change when we issue the guidance. So speaking of possibly making mistakes, which I sometimes do, before we open it for questions, I'm going to look at Julie, who also played a role in a lot of the drafting of this guidance, and ask her if there's something I mistakenly said or if there's something that's important to add to what I said. Nothing I would say is mistaken. I we just... Um, I guess say one thing um, related to Jerry's and Ivor's comments just to draw your attention to it, just elaborating on a point I think to make it more explicit um, about the scope of the guidance because um, the scope of the guidance as Ivor described it is quite targeted, right? Um, and I guess I wanted to say just three brief things related to that um, to try to facilitate our discussion here but also perhaps help inform the comments that we um, receive from you about the draft guidance. Um, so first, you know, just note that the scope of the guidance is quite narrow with regard to the types of studies of standard of care that we're talking about, right? We're only talking about these standard of care studies where there is, in fact, a suspected difference in risk, and the purpose of the study is to evaluate that risk. Right? The guidance is not addressing the other type of study that Jerry was speaking about where, in fact, there are no suspected risks associated with the uh, standards of care being evaluated. So the guidance is silent, or at least not explicitly addressing that scenario. Um, the other point I'll just make is that um, the guidance is also not addressing all reasonably foreseeable risks that we believe might need to be disclosed, even associated with the narrow type of standard of care uh, study at issue. Right. So we're not talking about sort of constraints on standard of care where that's not the purpose of the study 
right? That the purpose of the study is not to evaluate those constraints. You're imposing those constraints as a way of reducing variability, right? And making your findings more robust, but the purpose of them is not to be evaluating those differences, right? And then finally, I would say, you know, while the guidance addresses implicitly determining what the level of risk is, we are also not directly addressing how to assess what the level of risk is, whether there's, it's minimal risk or greater than minimal risk um, in, these, in these sorts of studies that are being addressed in the guidance. So I just say that as a way of saying, look, this is a way, in fact, in which our guidance is sort of narrowed and targeted. Um, and so we would welcome your comments, certainly, about all of those issues, because they are, I think, all beyond the scope of our current guidance. Um, so if you believe that they ought to be addressing those issues um, more fully, um, we would certainly welcome getting that kind of feedback. So we're, we're open for, we have to push that. we're open for comments. Microphones. Sure. Okay, uh, I just had a clear asking you to clarify. So, if there's a study comparing two standard of care that are out there, and there's a change in the risks, so standard of care A and standard of care B, and B, there's like more headache or whatever. So, are you saying that we can just list the changed risks? Or, or there, for each drug, there's going to be a whole litany of risks that, like, more common, less common, rare but serious. But are you saying that for these types of studies that we, we would only need lists maybe looking at those changed risks and therefore just list those? If the purpose of the study is to look specifically at the question of headaches taking this drug, and there is some, some basis for suspecting that there are differences in the frequency and severity of the headaches that people will experience depending on whether they get A or B or more or less of a dose of A or B, right? Then what you would want to say is you would, in order to describe the, if, if both of them do have some risk of headache, right, you would, you would be saying what we're interested in looking at is the difference in the amount of or the, the intensity or frequency of headaches that are a side effect of this drug, understanding that there's a chance of getting a headache getting either one of these drugs, but we are trying to figure out which one has worse or more frequent headaches. And then we wouldn't need to list the whole standard litany of risks involved with each drug, or do we still need to include that? The, the, the guidance document actually doesn't address that directly because it doesn't, as Julie suggested, it doesn't look at the whole array of how do you decide whether something is or is not a risk of research. So it will be a, I'm afraid that, will, that still goes into the it depends category and we would have to have further discussion about what you knew about those various side effects and whether they were looking at them and et cetera. Father David Cossey, a Columbia Medical Center IRB member, I've said before to you uh, in the hallway, good work. I want to say it here publicly. I think this is good stuff you're putting out. But I wonder, um, if uh, parents of support trial babies, in perhaps in support of their litigation, have sought to discover which arm their baby got assigned into, that would, con that would make the contrast of uh, the outcome even sharper than, well, my baby was uh, highly oxygenated compared to what a clinician would give my baby. Well, highly oxygenated in particular in comparison to the low oxygenation babies, the contrast is sharper if they knew which arm they were assigned to. 
Yeah, I, I don't think any of us knows. I mean, there is litigation. I would assume as part of that litigation, you know, those plaintiffs would in fact want to know what arm their, their infants were assigned to. But we don't have any direct knowledge of what's going on there. Uh, two quick questions. One about the support study. It seems that part of your criticism of support has to do with the scientific design rather than with the information that parents were provided, and yet the emphasis has no. been... Finish. Well, yeah, you okay, talked about just... the two groups being, uh, I forget the colors, the red and the green versus the yellow. That seems like a scientific design um, issue. Um, but my one question about support really is that if the criticism is that the, pa the parents were not given adequate information, it seemed to me on looking at the consent forms that at least were available online, that the biggest issue was that they were not given information in language they could understand. This was probably a group of parents with low health literacy, and yet the consent forms that I saw were written at a very high level. And I feel that actually that was the biggest violation of federal regulations, is that it was not given inadequate language. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about my second um, point, which has to do with the draft guidance. Um, and that is that I, I think I fall in the not clear enough category, but I'm not sure because it's not clear enough for me to know whether I disagree with it. Um, and my particular concern has to do with um, studies for which right now we may not give any consent. For instance, in cluster randomized studies, and I don't know enough about the PCORI aspirin trial, but that is one where I can imagine that you might randomize one set of clinics to do low dose and one set of clinics to do the higher dose aspirin and not necessarily have any type of consent procedure. I would ask that um, OHRP give us some guidance about having consent processes that are commensurate with what kind of consent is given in clinical practice for the type of intervention being considered. For instance, when you talk about aspirin, in general, most physicians would probably choose one or the other and not really give the patient a choice. They would essentially just tell the patients about the, the side effects of the given drug. Um, that's very different from a heart surgery s study where you're always going to have written consent. And in fact, in um, clinical care, you're always going to have a very detailed study of the risks and benefits. Sometimes with standard of care, because although there may be equipoise in the literature, there's not really clinical equipoise for the individual patient. You might choose one versus the other. That's a very different situation than, say, the aspirin thing, where it's mostly because of a, a clinician's um, institutional affiliation or training or something like that that they make the choice and they don't offer two things to the patient. So again, it's just a request that OHRP clarify that the level of consent required somehow be commensurate with what's required in clinical care. Thanks. Um, you raise a lot of questions here to, to quickly do this. Again, I, I certainly was not criticizing the design in the support study. Nothing I said was intended to say anything was wrong with that the design. Uh, in terms of the consent and support, uh, I think our biggest criticism, which was uh, I was highlighting, was basically telling the parents that this was a minimal risk study. It was no different than your baby getting clinical care. And the bottom line is no, actually, if you look at the distribution of where the infants were assigned before the study took place versus afterwards, basically you're moving the infants to the two ranges, ends of the range where people were concerned about greater risks. And that is the bottom line. Is it okay to do that without letting somebody know that that is a problem. Um, the level of language, I don't recall whether it was great or not, but that's a problem with lots of consent forms. I don't think the level of language was actually the biggest problem in terms of the support study. It was written in a way that was designed to make you, if you saw the, uh, the August 2013 public meeting, it was quite compelling when that one mom went out there and said, it was called support. I was given the impression this was a good thing for me in terms of enrolling my infant in the study. Uh, that just tells you exactly what it's all about. And there were lots, lots of parts of that consent form that were actually designed to reinforce the notion that 
don't worry about this. This is really a minimal risk study. It's not a bad thing in terms of you're enrolling your infant. Um, I'll let others comment on the guidance, but just your point about the aspirin. The, I will note after my heart surgery, both my surgeon and my cardiologist actually discussed the difference between the low dose and the high dose aspirin. It is actually a big thing for lots of clinicians out there. And if you're going to say you just use the level of discussion that happens in clinical care, support is a great example. My understanding is this is virtually never. The level of oxygen your infant gets is generally never discussed with parents because each center determines what it thinks is appropriate. So see what that means if you follow your your proposal, it would mean you could basically put all the infants at the 95 range in one center and you don't have to say anything to people in the research study because in terms of clinical care, they don't do that. The difference is that in clinical care, you're supposed to be doing, making a judgment call in terms of what's best for the infant and that gets back to what we allow in research. Others want to comment, right? There are comments of that there. I mean, I guess just related to the, the last point, you know, I think this is a, a question that certainly people can have different views about, um, whether in the research context there's an obligation to say more, right, um, than uh, what we're obligated or what we know happens often in the clinical setting, which is that there isn't that kind of discussion. Um, but in the research setting where there is a deliberate intent um, to change often the care that the, the subjects would have received outside of the research study, is there a higher obligation to disclose more information to those, those individuals as a means of trying to make their decision more informed? Uh, and the other thing I would, would say is that there have been discussions already in, related to this study um, and the general issues related about the issue of whether if the research design impedes a clinician's ability to modify the research intervention in some way based on their assessment of the condition of an individual research subject, whether that represents an added risk or not. That, that is, again, a topic that while it's certainly worthy of discussion, is not one that's directly addressed in this guidance document. So comment and a question. Uh, I think the level of anxiety that you experience is, is just that paralyzing fear that we will make well-intentioned, well-educated decisions and then be second-guessed later uh, by that after making those decisions. Uh, and in the age of Monday morning quarterbacking, <clears throat> excuse me, and all that sort of stuff, that a well-made decision, the we don't know study or we're clueless study might be the unicorn where we can all describe it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really exist because we gather all the information afterwards and find little differences to get second guess. And I think that's a lot of the fear that we have. The, the, the question is, the guidance document talks, it, it is very randomization on an individual level. I was hoping maybe you can make some comment on cluster randomization type studies and where this concept applies to those. I mean, cluster randomized trials raise very, very different issues or significantly different issues. We've been working with SACHARP. I mean, a number of players have been discussing this. We've worked with NIH in terms of its collaboratory studies. Uh, that is still a work in progress. In terms of your concerns about the We're Clueless studies, again, I don't think we've been shown a, a We're Clueless study that meets that standard. If you want to do such a, if somebody out there is contemplating doing such a study and thinking, uh, it doesn't come under these rules or we're not sure what it means, talk to us. I mean, I, I, my sense is that OHRP is actually more so than many other federal agencies incredibly open. Uh, we've been talking a lot about this. This is now a year and a half out there. Let's see the real studies. What, what is remarkable, because I'm sure PCORI would be out there probably raising concerns about some of the, the draft guidance, and yet the, the study they're busy promoting, the aspirin study, you could decide for yourself. It doesn't so sound like a we're a clueless study. Your average patient out there probably, you know, you could debate how big a deal it is between baby aspirin and, and again, adult aspirin, but probably a lot of people have a preference. They may say, look, I worry about my stomach, and given that you haven't yet shown that the larger dose is actually better in terms of preventing heart attacks and strokes, I'm going to sort of stick with the baby dose aspirin. Uh, 
Um, and again, remember what many people out there are saying, this is probably the study they want to do with minimized consent, I don't know what that means, with opt out, whatever it is, so that basically a lot of people may end up either be on you know, adult aspirin or baby dose aspirins without even really appreciating that there was a choice and what it actually means. So. Um, just to add, um, I, I agree that there are certainly differences, different issues that you have to take into consideration in cluster randomized trials. Um, SACHARP has been considering cluster randomized trials in general and circumstances in which informed consent is or isn't um, required. And they did in a um, recent uh, revision of their original guidance up or recommendations about cluster, cluster randomized trials um, take a position about what counts as a risk of research depending on the way in which it is designed um, for particular groups. Um, and I would encourage you to look at that. I believe that the position they're taking is more or less consistent with the position we're taking in this context, but that doesn't make it necessarily the same. With respect to the gotcha issue, um, you know, this is something that obviously we have to be very sensitive about. Um, we are stuck in the position that oftentimes the complaint occurs after the study is over. We got the complaint roughly two years after the study was completed, right? And so there was nothing that they could do about it anymore, right? One would love to be able to look at all of the, to have all the complaints come in before the trials get started so that we can resolve and decide whether there's anything wrong before the studies get started, but that would raise a whole other different hue and cry. We do recognize that there are some, that the nature of research is such that sometimes you get the opposite result of what you expected to get. We had a consultation recently with NIH about a study in which exactly that happened. Um, but it was a different, the, the, the circumstances of the study were such that we, in that, in that case, we didn't see a problem with what they'd done. They thought they were going to get a positive outcome by a particular research intervention. They didn't get it. Um, that's unfortunate, but it's very important information to have in order to stop doing something that seemed like a good idea, but in fact turned out not to be. And just to add, you know, the, the per, our guidance is oriented towards trying to um, indicate that this is prospective looking, right, and not retrospective, and that we're trying to um, say that the risks that we think need to be disclosed are those, in fact, that are identified, right, as a purpose of the study so they would be known at the initiation rather than in retrospect once the study is complete. So and we're very cognizant of that concern. Yeah, and that's, that's why, as you saw in Jerry's slides, we look to see if there was a recognition before the study started of what the risks of the support study were. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Brian Moore. I'm from Wake Forest School of Medicine. My question is regarding the applicability of the guidance. Uh, we have encountered possible studies that are looking at comparative effectiveness that are sponsored by private agencies, not federally funded, but are looking at FDA-regulated products. So could you speak to whether FDA is in agreement with this guidance with regard to their consent requirements? Um, I, don't, I don't know that we could say that FDA necessarily is in agreement. I mean, in terms of what FDA would enforce, I, I think the best thing is probably for you to ask FDA. I mean, we have jurisdiction, again, over HHS-sponsored trials or other things within their jurisdiction because it's at an institution that checks the box. Uh, apart from that, I don't know if... Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, of course, we are collaborating with FDA, you know, on this guidance as well as others. So we are in conversation with, with FDA about this issue. 
Um, recognize too, this is of course just a draft guidance document on which we're seeking public comment. So it doesn't represent, um, you know, our view uh, at the moment in terms of how we might enforce. So there is, and I expect will be, the opportunity for us to have conversations with FDA before we would ever issue a final guidance. And hopefully, this will become more clear uh, when we do, in fact, develop the final product. And lastly, I just point out that FDA did recently issue a revision of its draft guidance on informed consent that covers this general territory. Um, so I would encourage you to go back and look at that guidance um, to maybe help you frame exactly what question you ask of FDA with respect to the language in their newly revised document. Uh, Frank Zeeve from the Richmond VA Hospital. I'd like to raise an issue that both Dr. Pritchard and Dr. Menikoff have touched on, but which is not really in the new guidance, which is the, the risk created by the fact of randomization. In other words, when you, when you do a randomization between two acceptable therapies, you remove uh, as you mentioned, you remove the judgment of the physician as to what would be better for this particular patient. But mo also, equally important, you remove the best judgment of the patient. And this is something that comes up clinically all the time. In other words, I, I treat uh, diabetes for a, for a living, and there are as many approved lines of therapy as there are grains of sand in the Sahara. And, and I do not recommend the same treatment for every patient, and I frequently, in a discussion with a patient, he comes up with a reason that A would be preferable to B. And so I'm more and more coming to sort of to the conclusion that when you have a randomization of any sort, it can't be minimal risk. I'd like some comments on that. Sure, so what we try to say in the guidance is, and I think this is even broader than what you're saying, we don't look at randomization so much as creating risk, but I think following the theme of eliminating the judgment of the physician, any time the study basically assigns somebody to some different treatment than what they might otherwise have gotten in clinical care, that is what we're looking at. So you could have done support and assigned all of the infants to 95. I think that would raise the same issue. Maybe they shouldn't have been at 95. That you did a randomized study instead complicates a little more, but the concept is there. Anytime you go into a study, it arbitrarily assigns a particular treatment, and that treatment may be different than some other version of standard of care that the infant or an adult or whatever would have gotten outside of the study. There is exactly the issue you're raising there. And I mean, there are some excellent talks going back to the August 23rd meeting. Uh, people like Chuck Natanson from, from NIH uh, gave his personal views, because he studies a lot of these, that often physicians actually have reasons for the clinical judgments they make. And when you do these randomized studies, particularly when you randomize people to one end or another end of a continuum, you're eliminating all of that judgment. And, and that is a problem. So it's a great point. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think with respect to the individual patient um, and prospective subject issue, it's also a relevant question, which is in part why we think the options should be presented to the prospective subject. Say you've got two studies where somebody's going to get surgery and one of them requires more extensive physical therapy than another and you're looking at the, you're asking the question of which treatment will be better and part of the concern is that patients tend to eventually sort of give up on the physical therapy because it's pretty extensive, right? And if you say to somebody that that's the case when you're asking them to participate in the study, then maybe it's the case that they'll say, well, you know, I actually don't know because I've never gone through physical therapy. I don't know how diligent I'll be about it or not. Um, I'm willing to participate in the study. On the other hand, you may have somebody who says, I know myself, I'm an outlier, right? You tell me to do physical therapy and I'll do it till the cows come home. So I'm not going to participate in the study because I think I'm not going to be the kind of person who's going to 
be subject to the problem that you identify in one of the arms of that study, I'm not going to leave it to chance which treatment I'm going to go with because I think this one is one of them is better suited to my particular condition. And just to your question about um, you know the level of risk that is created by randomization, I guess I wouldn't conclude that randomization between standards of care would necessarily always lead to greater than minimal risk. You know, I think that's really going to be a function of the nature of the interventions at issue, and it's going to depend on how different the risks are between those interventions, because I think there can be studies um, where you're randomizing to different standards of care that, in fact, are minimal risk. Let me just give you an example. What I had actually had in the back of my mind here was there have been a lot of studies of giving the, the identical antihypertensive drug in the morning or at bedtime. Uh, and there are reasons for doing these studies. But you would think, just on the surface of it, now either one of these would be within standard of care. I could do this with any given patient. It just says give it daily. I could give it say you take it at bedtime or you take it in the morning. But patient X may know that he falls asleep on the couch most of the time and doesn't take meds bed at bedtime well. So here is something where you it's the same drug, it's approved, it's given according to the label. There's nothing wrong with it apparently. It should be minimal risk, but it isn't. Thank you. We're because we're at time, we're just going to take the questions from the people who are standing at the microphone. Kathleen Kennedy, UT Houston. My question is really about how you envision the principles that you've laid out for us being implemented in the real world. And I'm a clinician. I'm also an investigator. I'm, I've been involved in lots of studies involving comparisons of common practice. And it seems to me if, if we wanted to have a conversation with the subject, we could do exactly what you've outlined, and it sounds great. We could explain to them the pros and cons of this strategy and the pros and cons of that strategy. But in order to really inform them well, we need to know what they would be getting if they weren't in the study. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's up to the patient, sometimes it's up to the doctor, sometimes it's up to what hospital they're in. And so, in order to really inform them well, it has to be sort of a one-on-one -on -one individualized conversation. And now, on top of all of that, in the aftermath of support, we have increasing paranoia about every word that's in the consent form. So I'm trying to figure out how we make a document that complies with all of the ways our IRBs interpret the regulations, where you've got a purpose section, and a risk section and a benefits section. And there's just no way to do that in a way that makes sense because what's the risk and benefit to this patient depends on what he might be getting if he weren't in the study. And it's gonna be diff maybe different among patients in my own site. It certainly is gonna be different among patients in site A and site B. And now the NIH is saying we all have to have a single IRB approved the protocol and the consents for all sites in a multi-center study. So I just, I don't see how this is supposed to work with the consent document. I, I can see how it would work with an individual study coordinator or PI conversation, which I think we all know is where the rubber really meets the road anyway. But what we're all being Monday morning quarterbacked about is not what those conversations were, but about what was in the consent form. And I don't have a clue how we're supposed to write those. Okay, so let's take support as an example. It probably wouldn't have been that hard, and we're talking about one paragraph or so. We have concerns about the high end, and, and we have concerns about the low end, and basically there's a continuum there. And you could indicate in the consent form you should perhaps talk with your clinician about what they would have recommended in terms of clinical care had you not been in the study. I don't actually think that would have been that complicated, as to the consent form in general, it would be nice to hear more from you about your concern that like every word was being picked apart. Um, if you look at the consent form in the support study, and there were a few versions of it, 
again, in multiple ways, it basically did a lot to basically suggest this is not a very risky study. Well, and when I say it was picked apart, there were some criticisms, and I can't remember who made what criticisms, but criticisms that this, this was mentioned in the purpose section, but it wasn't mentioned in the risks section. And so it seems to me we need to get away from some of this, you know, over nitpicking about whether or not it's in this section of the consent form or the other section of the consent form, if we had the flexibility to just have a sort of written conversation with the subject instead of, you know, over analyzing what's in what section of the consent form, because really in the risk section of the consent form, if what that is is the risk of study participation versus not participating, if the overall risks of study participation were known to be different from not participating, we wouldn't be doing the study. If we knew that either arm overall, so maybe with aspirin, the risk of high dose is hemorrhagic stroke and the risk of low dose is MI, but overall, experts in the field think that the risks of getting into one arm or the other is the same as what you would have in the real world, getting into one or the other, then that's really not a risk of study participation. And, and while I agree with you that we ought to explain to the subjects what the pros and cons of either arm might be, those are not study risks. Those are risks of whether you happen to get one treatment versus the other, and it could go either way, whether you're in the study or not. I, I guess I'm not sure what you're saying. So you're basically saying it would have been fine to any clinician, even if they genuinely believed that you should treat infants at 90 or below and that you're worried about going near 95. They could arbitrarily have put that infant at 95 and you're saying it's what? It's no risk because some clinicians out there are doing that? No, I'm, I'm not saying what some clinicians are doing. I'm saying among all of the best informed experts in the field, there is general recognition that we don't know whether it's better to be between 90 and 95, between 85 and 90, or to let it vary between 85 and 95. And so we don't know going into the study. But, let's see, but it is dumbing down what they know. There are certain concerns at the high end and certain mm -hmm. concerns at the low end, and at whatever level you assign an infant, you are affecting what suspected risks they are being exposed to. And that is the bottom line in terms of our concern with the consent form. It's not about what section you put it in, but it is about clearly telling the person whether it's the parents or the actual adult subject, information in a clear way that indicates to them, look, this is a study in which you, could, you should legitimately worry about bad things happening to you versus having your clinician make a determination. That is all it is about. It is not about fine points of, of labeling it as risks or whatever. Well, I'm, my fear is that IRBs have been so paranoid in the aftermath of support that it's gonna be very difficult for them to afford investigators the flexibility that investigators need to really say it clearly and come, plainly to the people. Feel patient. free to come to us and again, I really genuinely encourage everybody, show us possible consent form language. We would love to have examples out there so everybody can know this is a good consent form and we could discuss good language even for support, but it's, it's not actually that subtle a thing. When you look at what that consent form was about, what it overall was trying to do, it was sending a pretty clear message. And, and just to um, make a comment about another piece of your question, um, I think that our draft guidance is, is not written so much from the standpoint of looking at the aggregate level of risk to each of the arms of the study, but much more so toward the perspective of the individual subject who understanding that it may be that right now it looks like the, the risks of a lower dose of getting aspirin um, might mean that I don't get, um, uh, uh, that I do get a heart attack, whereas if I take more aspirin, um, uh, I'm going to have less of a heart, chances of getting a heart attack, but I might get a stroke. 
The notion is that the person might have a preference with respect to whether they want to run the greater risk of the stroke or whether they want to run the greater risk of the aspirin, and so they should be able to make that decision. If they think, well, you know, I don't like either stroke or um, a heart attack, so I'm willing to participate, well, it's, it's, that's fine. Yeah, and I would say, you know, just that said, even in the absence of knowing what they would have gotten outside of the study, sort of it is kind of, I think, removing them from the specific situation um, which the, they might have had a conversation with their individual clinician about, and they should, right? But I think our guidance is not suggesting that that also needs to be embedded in the consent document. Last word. You're out of town, out of town, but out of time. But um, I'm Ron Ariano from uh, Stanford University, and um, I'm a neonatologist with 40 years of experience. And and I, I think there are certain areas that uh, are important to point out. One, I, I think the uh, draft statement, uh, uh, draft guidance, uh, has has uh, merit and concept, and I, I think it has some difficulty in terms of the realistic application of it uh, because of a, a few things that I would point out to you. Uh, number one, I think that the the, um, a curve showing uh, the saturation levels, and it's not oxygen that the patient was delivered, it was their measured saturations, um, were, uh, would be great if they were that distinct in clinical practice. Uh, the, the real reality is that they run all the way from below 85 to above 92. And uh, we've struggled long and hard to try to get more control, but there are practical technical reasons why we can't do better. I also should add and that when we were doing the support trial, uh, one of the failures was that none of the centers were able to achieve the target oxygen levels, oxygen satura saturations level. So it took, um, if you will, practicing as a, uh, as a team to really achieve those levels. So it's very difficult to achieve and keep them within that. And if you look at the paper, you'll, you'll see that it wasn't 100% in either of, either of the zones. The last point I would make is that um, I think people in the IRB world need to understand that clinical, um, clinical judgment always trumps any research protocol. So if a neonatologist saw a baby struggling in whatever category they were in, uh, that treatment would be changed immediately. So that's irrespective of any research protocol. And then finally, I would say that, you know, we have so much variation in practice within neonatology. So if you look at the Oxford Vermont Network, uh, network um, information, you'll see um, the incidences for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, infection, line infections, and so forth, varies across the map. So within a, in a particular unit, the kinds of clinical practice that are going on are very, very varied. So if a parent came to me and said, you know, please keep my baby at a saturation of 90%, I'd have to tell them that's impossible. I just can't really do it. Uh, so I think you have to understand there were some um, design issues that, that really uh, challenge the clinical practice capability of doing that as a realistic target goal, keeping saturations, and it wasn't always achieved under the best possible circumstances because we have technological limits. Yeah, no, those are very valid points, and, and yes, we fully appreciate the difficulty in terms of actually keeping an infant at a particular value. Of course, there ultimately was what they were trying to accomplish in the study and what it would have meant had they accomplished it. Um, in terms of your broader point, which is sort of about the whole discussion we're having here, there is a lot of variation in practice in lots of areas, and the bottom line question here is if there is variation and there are suspected risks on one end or the other end in the middle, whatever it is, when can we say because there is variation, it is basically minimal risk to take people and assign them to anything within that range of variation with the conclusion that, look, it's all within the range of standard care. That means this is pretty much a minimal risk study and it's not a big deal for you to be in the study or not be in the study. I think that's the heart of, yeah, of the I, discussion. I, I agree with your, 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 your concepts of applying the risk. I'm just trying to give some context to the difficulty sure. in doing it. And, and I think that neonatology may be a special case. I mean, we're one of the few fields that more than 90% of the drugs that we use are non-approved or off-label. Um, and that goes for any of the treatments that we use are in that category. So when you're talking about a standard of practice, you know, we've done the best that we could in a young sure. field. Uh, we're about the same age as Primer. <laughs> 
and uh, we're doing the best we can. But we, we definitely need compar comparative research studies to advance our field and improve the care that we provide for women and children and their family. And, and so. we totally agree with that in terms of we're not trying to discourage comparative effectiveness. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you.